Bueno, pues buenos días. Eh, por supuesto, tengo que, tengo que decir, y es fácil de imaginar y entender, que para mí es un honor presentar a Biblioteca Galdicas. Corría el año 1975, os contaré una pequeña anécdota personal, cuando vi, y los de mi generación, solo yo, claro, la imagen de Biblioteca Galdicas por primera vez en la portada de la revista National Geographic. Era entonces una joven eh, de pelo largo que sostenía un orangután en sus brazos, una portada mítica de la revista National Geographic. Entonces fue cuando supe de su existencia y de sus investigaciones, supimos. Entonces era yo un alumno de cuarto de carrera de biológicas. Y por supuesto me impresionó muchísimo y me absorbió la historia de las investigaciones que llevaba a cabo Biblioteca Aldicas en las selvas, en las remotas selvas de Borneo. Yo nos iba a decir entonces que algún día vendría a Burgos. En el año 1975 no existía Atapuerca. Bueno, Atapuerca existía desde hace más de un millón de años, pero no sabíamos de su existencia. No existía el Museo de la Evolución Humana, obviamente. Eh, Burgos no se había convertido en una capital mundial de la evolución humana y no existía, tampoco, claro, la Universidad de Burgos. Es decir, no existía nada de lo que ahora disfrutamos, una universidad que apuesta por la investigación y por la divulgación, un museo que hay que repetir siempre hasta que, hasta que terminemos por creérnoslo, que es el mayor museo del mundo de evolución humana, el más grande, por lo menos, del planeta, de evolución humana, digo que tenemos que seguir repitiéndolo hasta que terminemos por creérnoslo, porque es verdad, lo cual supone, obviamente, un orgullo, pero también una responsabilidad, la responsabilidad del liderazgo, tenemos que seguir poniéndonos retos, tenemos que seguir avanzando siempre, no tenemos nunca que conformarnos, tenemos que seguir mejorando en ese museo. También un centro de investigación, al lado del museo, un auditorio, en fin, las infraestructuras con las que contamos ahora eh, me habrían parecido pues, una locura, un sueño imposible, en el año 1975, cuando Biblioteca Aldicas se había desplazado ya a las selvas de Borneo y ya llevaba un tiempo investigando sobre los orangutanes. Echando la vista atrás, nos damos cuenta de lo poco que sabíamos sobre nuestros parientes más cercanos en aquella época. Todavía no sabíamos nada sobre los chimpancés, gorilas, orangutanes. Empezábamos a ver cosas, el mundo empezaba a sorprenderse con lo que se estaba descubriendo en ese momento y que, por supuesto, era fundamental para alguien que quisiera dedicarse al estudio de la evolución humana. No porque nuestros parientes más cercanos, los chimpancés, los gorilas, los orangutanes, representen especies congeladas en el tiempo, o, o, o eh, formas análogas a, a nuestros antepasados, porque esta es la pregunta que se repite siempre eh, cuando se habla de la evolución humana, la pregunta que, que la sociedad plantea siempre, la de por qué los, se suele preguntar por qué los monos no han evolucionado, ¿eh? por qué nosotros hemos evolucionado y los simios no han evolucionado. Explicar que sí han evolucionado, es el principal problema de la divulgación científica en el campo de la evolución. Explicar que la evolución no se dirige hacia el ser humano y que hay muchas líneas evolutivas y que todas las especies han evolucionado, en el caso de nuestros parientes más cercanos, para convertirse en lo que son. Es decir, no en una forma, no en un fósil viviente, nuestros parientes cercanos no son fósiles vivientes, son líneas evolutivas diferentes y muy diferentes entre sí. Los orangutanes han evolucionado para convertirse en orangutanes, los chimpancés han evolucionado para convertirse en chimpancés, en mejores chimpancés, los gorilas, han evolucionado para convertirse en gorilas. Y no sabíamos nada de su ecología, de su dieta, de su nicho, pero tampoco sabíamos nada de su comportamiento, de su comportamiento del productor, por ejemplo, de su biología, no sabíamos nada de su desarrollo, no sabíamos nada. No sabíamos nada tampoco, por supuesto, de su vida social o de su ausencia de vida social, en el caso de las especies solitarias. Y, sin embargo, especulábamos 
especulábamos sobre la condición humana, especulábamos sobre la evolución humana, especulábamos sobre nuestros antepasados, especulábamos sobre nuestra evolución y nuestra naturaleza desde la ignorancia absoluta. Sabíamos absolutamente nada acerca de la reproducción, de la sexualidad, de la maternidad, de la alimentación, de nada de lo que se refiere a estos no fósiles vivientes, sino parientes nuestros, líneas diferentes. Bien, en todo este tiempo, desde el año 75, se ha progresado mucho, hemos aprendido más, nos hemos dado cuenta de, nuestra, de lo inmensa que era nuestra ignorancia y de, lo, eh, y de la falta de fundamento de nuestras especulaciones y, por lo tanto, de lo absurdo de muchas de nuestras conclusiones y paradigmas. Eso se ha logrado gracias al trabajo de personas como Virute Galdicas. Ella estudió la especie más difícil de hominoideo, de gran simio, la especie más solitaria, la más esquiva, eh, la más eh, difícil de estudiar, una, y en, en unas condiciones quizá las más difíciles también. Eh, de forma que su trabajo pues, tiene un, un, un valor enorme, porque se enfrentó al mayor de los retos. Eh, afortunadamente lo superó, aprendimos mucho, corrió el tiempo y en este mismo recinto en el que han resonado voces como la de Humberto Eco, pues hoy tenemos la oportunidad de escuchar una de las voces más importantes del siglo XX, del siglo XXI, porque hay algunos científicos como ella que se convierten en figuras imprescindibles, en iconos, en iconos vivientes, en iconos activos, es decir, en protagonistas de la sociedad, de la cultura, en general del pensamiento. Y su investigación trasciende con mucho lo que puede ser la investigación científica especializada, porque el ámbito de sus eh, investigaciones es universal. La importancia de una investigación, la relevancia de una investigación, precisamente, consiste en eso, consiste en que abarca muchos campos y que los descubrimientos interesan en amplios sectores del conocimiento. Ese es el caso de las investigaciones de bibliotecas galdicas que interesan no solo al ecólogo, no solo al antropólogo, no solo al paleontólogo, por supuesto, sino también pues, al psicólogo, al sociólogo, porque lo que nos tiene eh, que contar acerca de la naturaleza y del comportamiento de los grandes simios nos interesa a todos. De forma que, en su caso, en particular, se cumple lo que escribió Edward Wilson cuando dijo que la ciencia bien hecha es humanidades. De manera que si el estudio de los hominoideos no es humanidades, no sé yo qué puede hacerlo. Y efectivamente, uno de los méritos del trabajo de Viluté es haber contribuido a borrar las fronteras entre las ciencias naturales y experimentales y las humanidades. Y luego, por último, otra cosa muy importante que ha cambiado desde el año 1975 hasta hoy y que ha cambiado para peor, y es el tamaño de las selvas. En las selvas en las que vivían los orangutanes que estudiaba Viruté, en Borneo y en Sumatra se aprecia una destrucción acelerada que ha hecho que esas selvas, esta es una historia de fracaso, no una historia de éxito, esas selvas sean cada vez más pequeñas. Viruté también tiene en eso un compromiso, ha adquirido un compromiso a través de una organización que la preside, aparte de su investigación, que es la Fundación Orangután, un compromiso con el medio ambiente, un compromiso con la, con la conservación y, por lo tanto, un compromiso con el futuro, con el futuro de la humanidad. Así que Viruté Galdicas es no solo una científica, no solo una humanista, no solo bueno, una divulgadora, no solo nuestra heroína, para muchos de nosotros, que la vimos en aquellas fotos y la seguimos considerando nuestra heroína, sino que también es una, se puede decir, profeta, una mujer comprometida, una mujer con valores que nos hace a todos admirarla todavía mucho más. Y sin más, ya le cedo la palabra. Let me get my microphone. Okay. 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 Okay
So I am delighted to be in Spain. I am delighted to be in this beautiful city of Burgos. And uh, uh, even though I have no genetic or cultural necessarily connection to Spain directly, I do have some, and our project has some uh, connections to Spain. And I would like to mention some of them. One of them is that the only other time that I've been to Spain, it was only for a few days, uh, I received an award uh, from a fa Spanish association. And the award was an interesting one. It was for exploration. Uh, our first permanent veterinarian uh, was a Spanish uh, lady, woman, Dr. Rosa. And she helped us set up the uh, orangutan uh, care center and quarantine, our veterinary hospital in Indonesia. And she was from Barcelona. And she worked with us, like I said, for three years. And then finally, I think it was last year, um, I was honored to be made the honorary head of the Great Apes Project in Spain. And that's one of the, I think one of the best honors that I have received in a long time. So again, even though in some ways I'm disconnected from Spain, there are points with which I am connected. So like I said, I am delighted, absolutely delighted to be here. And I'm delighted that I was honored uh, to help open this wonderful Congress. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. So I have been working in Indonesia for the last 48 years, almost 50 years. And what I have been doing is I have been studying wild orangutans in order to understand their life history. And also I have been working very hard to protect not only orangutans, but also the forests in which they live. Because without forests, orangutans cannot survive. And the irony is that without forests, people cannot survive either. So this picture was taken many years ago. And I sometimes give uh, talks to underprivileged children in the United States. And <laughs> during a question and answer period, one of the children, who was maybe an eight or nine year old boy, pointed at this picture and said, who is that woman? <laughs> I had to answer that that was me, but me many, many years ago. So this is a conference on uh, communicating science to the public. I was very fortunate because my mentor, and I made him my mentor. <laughs> I'm trying to see. Ah, Louis Leakey. This is me. He's a young woman in my early 20s, just before I went to Indonesia. And this is my former husband, Rod Vrindemore, who went with me initially. And Louis Leakey was a legend in his own time. And Louis Leakey was that very rare person, half a century ago, 60 years ago, who was a communicator of science. You know, he held press conferences. Uh, he invited journalists to follow him when he uh, went to archaeological sites. Uh, he published articles in National Geographic, as well as in Nature. So he was a pioneer in uh, communicating science to the public. And he was very good with the quip. And I think the British, he, he's actually Kenyan. He was actually Kenyan, but of British heritage. Uh, so he would say things to the public like, oh, American archaeologists wouldn't know a fossil hominine unless it bit them. <laughs> and of course, the American press, the American uh, journalists just just ate it up. I mean, that's actually a funny quip. I didn't see anybody smile, but <laughs> the Americans got it. So uh, I was very fortunate because I was able to follow, in a way, in his footsteps. And it wasn't just me, but also my sister, 
in Great Apes, Jane Goodall, and the late Diane Fosley, and this is me. So, and we were known, or are known, as the, tri the Trimates. And Louis Leakey would call his, his three primates. And the reason that it was funny is you're not probably acquainted with uh, titles in the uh, Anglican Church, but a primate is a high-ranking cleric. So, you know, he, he chuckled whenever he called us the three primates. So, I have spent the last 48 years of my life working and studying and living with orangutans. And what does orangutan mean? Well, orangutan means, in Indonesian and in Malay, person of the forest. And in fact, there are many stories about orangutans. And one of those stories is that orangutans can speak, but they refuse to do so because they don't want to be put to work. And then, of course, there are many stories about orangutan males kidnapping and taking women up into the trees. And also, less known, there are also stories about orangutan females kidnapping men, human men, and taking them up into the trees. And some of the stories are kind of reminiscent of the story about uh, Solomon and the, uh, the two mothers who claimed the child, where, uh, you know, the, the woman, human mother runs away, so the orangutan male tears the child in half and throws the human half onto the mother. Many interesting stories. So, orangutans are our cousins. Or maybe they're actually our siblings. And so when I first started talking about orangutans in Indonesia, I spoke to village chiefs, I spoke to gatherings of government officials, I spoke to cabinet ministers, I even had the chance to speak several times in front of the president of Indonesia, several times, not the current one, but the ones previous. And when I said to people that orangutans are our saudara, initially, people would laugh. It was a concept they didn't understand or even acknowledge. And saudara in Indonesian means sibling, but Indonesians are very kin inclusive. So saudara can also mean a cousin. So when I said orangutans are our saudara, uh, at first they laughed. But I'll tell you something. Nowadays they're not laughing because they understand that to the core of their beings, at least the officials uh, in the national and provincial governments. So that was one of the things that I tried to do as much as possible, was to communicate the fact that orangutans were not just different from other animals, because they're not all that different, we humans are animals, but that they were a special kind of animal, and they were particularly special to Indonesia, because orangutans are only found in two places on this planet. One of them is Malaysia, and one of them is Indonesia. But in Malaysia, they're found in the northern part of Borneo, and most of Borneo consists of Indonesia. And then the other orangutans are the Sumatran orangutans, who, you know, Sumatra is exclusively Indonesian. So if we look at this chart, here's orangutans. And so our ancestors separated from the ancestors of orangutans anywhere, usually they say about 13 million years ago, sometimes 10 to 10 to 13. So we shared the same ancestors with orangutans 13 million years ago. And then, gorillas split off. And then, chimpanzees and humans uh, split off. And then chimpanzees and bonobos split off. So basically, we share a heritage with chimpanzees about six million years ago. Six million years ago, we and they had the same uh, ancestors. So chimpanzees are our, clo our closest living relatives. They share 99.5% of their genetic material with us. 
They are so closely related to us that we can receive a blood transfusion from a chimpanzee once blood groups are matched, and chimpanzees can receive a blood transfusion from us. There are people on this planet walking today who have chimpanzee blood in their veins because that was the only blood that was available to give them. And this is not a joke. I suspect that Keith Richards, you know him, the Rolling Stones, is one of those people. And the reason I suspect it, I say it's not a joke, it's because uh, there are certain countries that when you visit, like Japan, uh, you know, if you're a rock and roller, they test you. They test you inside out to see if you have drugs in your system. So people like Keith Richards go and get their blood washed, usually in Switzerland. And, you know, sometimes you have to, you can be cooked up to a chimpanzee and the blood goes through you. Chimpanzee's blood goes through you and the human blood goes through the chimpanzee and it's all done. And both of you walk away. So that's how close we and chimpanzees are. Chimpanzees are truly our siblings. But what about orangutans? Orangutans share 97% of their DNA with humans. We cannot receive a blood transfusion from an orangutan. If we did, we would die. A chimpanzee cannot receive a blood transfusion from an orangutan. If they did, they would die. So, you know, there's a, there's a little diff distance between us and orangutans. But that distance is something that makes them a little special. And as I mentioned, orangutans are only found two places on this planet. Malaysia, this is North Malaysia, and Indonesia, and here. Tanjung Puting is where I work, and I've been working for almost 50 years. And then this is Sumatra, where you have the Sumatran species of orangutan. So when I went into the field, Many, many years ago, <laughs> um, there was only one species of orangutan. Now there are three. So has anything changed in nature? Nothing. What has changed are the opinions of scientists, you know, as to how distinct these populations of uh, orangutans are. Uh, this, I just put this in because <laughs> I like the picture, and it's... Uh, Alfred Russell Wallace and Charles Darwin together, uh, the people who basically established the, uh, the concept of, uh, of evolution for modern biology. Just a funny picture. And Charles Darwin was influenced by orangutans. We don't realize it, but he spent several years watching uh, a female orangutan in the London Zoo whose name was Jenny. And Jenny influenced him in the way that she influences, she would influence us. What influenced him was the fact that she was a noble creature and also she was very similar in her behavior and her expressions to human beings, even though she was an orangutan, not a chimpanzee. That 97% difference Sorry, that 97% similarity and the 3% difference is not that different. Now, Alfred Russell Wallace had a different relationship to orangutans. Alfred Russell Wallace went to Borneo and east, although initially he went to um, uh, the Amazon area, of South America. And I have called him in public an orangutan murderer, because I've read his books. And he personally killed, I counted them, at least 30 orangutans. He collected their bodies, you know, and sent their bones and their skins uh, to museums and uh, other collections in mainly England. And that's how he made his living, because like uh, Charles Darwin, he was not a member of the British elite, of the British gentry class, maybe not noble class, but gentry class. So he also documented in his book 
uh, Dayaks, where the Aboriginal people of Borneo, fighting with orangutans. And I can tell you from all the stories I have heard, it's always the people who provoke the orangutans. It's never, it's never the reverse, because orangutans in the wild are so wary of humans, and they live up in the canopy. They spend 95% of their time up in the canopy, you know, 100 feet, 200 feet even, about the ground, that when I first went to Borneo, Louis Leakey gave me 10 years to actually meet one, to actually encounter one in the wild. Well, it didn't take me 10 years. And the reason it didn't take me 10 years is because I went to the right place, and I was told to go to the right place by uh, Indonesian officials who had, in the forestry department, who kind of knew who had surveyed orangutans and forests in Borneo and Sumatra. So, for some reason, this is not as clear as it was in my, in my laptop, but I'd like to talk about dolphins. And we all know what a dolphin looks like. I'm going to put two on the screen. We talk about dolphins. What do we know about dolphins? What makes dolphins so special? Well, dolphins have sonar and echolocution. And in the United States, dolphins are actually used for medical therapy. And the thing about a dolphin is you can't fool a dolphin. Because dolphins have sonar. When they look at you, they don't just see you, they see your bones, they see your heart beating, they see your liver, they see the feces that happen to be still in your body, and they can tell in an instant whether or not you are well. And if you have a health problem, they can usually, quote unquote, diagnose it. So for instance, dolphins have been used in the United States uh, to diagnose kidney stones, and then with their echo location and sonar abilities, they can actually break up those kidney stones without you having to go to the hospital. You're still in the, in the pool with the dolphin. So people have said that dolphins have an intelligence, or I've said it actually, <laughs> that dolphins have an intelligence that is beyond our measure. I mean, their intelligence is so different from us you know, it's based on sonar, it's based on the auditory capabilities, that it's very difficult for us to understand dolphin culture and what dolphins are actually like and how smart they are. Because they live in a totally different realm than we humans. And this is a fact. I mean, I've spent hours talking to uh, at least one woman who works with dolphins, and she is a therapist. She works with autistic children primarily, but she also works with, uh, you know, with kind of ordinary, you know, adults. And so, if you want to have a dolphin <laughs> diagnose you and give you medical treatment, you pay several thousand dollars, and you go to Florida, and you spend five days with them, an hour in the pool each day. And, you know, they're, I, I do not believe in holding animals in captivity, but basically, oh, sorry. I should, I like to walk, so. Okay, but basically, um, the dolphins, you know, I don't believe in animals in, being in captivity, so I spent a lot of time talking about these dolphins. And, you know, I was relatively satisfied that they're very well treated, and they are ones that, we're basically should have been rehabilitated, but we're not. Okay, so we talked about dolphins. Keep them in mind, please. Let's talk about orangutans. So where do orangutans live? Orangutans live in the top of the canopy. Like I said, 100 feet up in the air. They're also solitary. When they become adult, they're very different from chimpanzees, gorillas, and humans. Uh, they, uh, they're solitary. And they don't need you. They don't want you. They're not interested in you. 
And that's what you discover when you are an orangutan researcher. That it's very, it's not like, you know, Jane Goodall who went to Gombe and became friends with the wild chimpanzees of Gombe, or Diane Fossey who became friends, you know, and touched the wild gorillas that she worked with in the Burunga volcanoes. No, I mean, orangutans are up there. They're almost like God. You know, they don't need you. They don't care about you. But, I once read an article, and this article talked about ways in which to make people love you. And it was a list. And as I read the list, I realized, gradually realized, that virtually everything in that list orangutans did. So if you actually came into contact with them, and they actually looked at you, and were aware of you, that they did things that made you fall in love with them. And this is one of the reasons, I think, why so many people who go to places where they can have contact with free-ranging orangutans come back absolutely mesmerized, absolutely enchanted. So what are these things? Well, the first thing is if you want to make somebody fall in love with you, and I've actually tried it, <laughs> um, what you do in no malicious way, no malicious way, is you stare them in the eyes and you do not break off that stare. Now, the problem is that the other person might break off the stare, but if he or she doesn't, then you will have a contact or a relationship with that person that will last for years. But that's what orangutans do. They don't have sonar. They don't do echolocation. But what they do do is they stare at you. When they stare at you, it's like they're peering into your very soul. They're peering to the core of your essence, not a physical essence. Like the, like the dolphins. I mean, the dolphins peer into your physical essence. Orangutans peer into your very soul. And they look at you. And even sometimes when you have contact with wild orangutans, and they come down and they look at you, you will remember that look the rest of your life because it goes right into your very soul. So that's the one thing that they do. They mesmerize you. And the infants especially are very good at this. They have those brown liquid eyes with, not so evident in this picture, but with whites around them. The second thing that they do is they fall on you. They jump into your arms or they, or they jump on you. And that's another method for making somebody fall in love with you is you fall into them. I mean, you may break their backs, but if they catch you, and usually they catch you if you're falling into them. Uh, and orangutans do that. And I was first aware of that. I mean, I knew that this happened. This ha often happened to me. The, pr the first time I went to Sapilak, I saw an orangutan in the distance, way up in the trees. She came straight towards me, and then she jumped on me and knocked me to the ground and kind of was on top of me. And that also made a very real and intimate connection. And I know the connection works because uh, an American journalist who became a television producer for IMAX, uh, he said that when he went to Camp Leakey, as he was walking down the boardwalk, an orangutan juvenile jumped on him, jumped into his arms. He stayed at Camp Leakey for several days and he left. And when he contacted me again, it was 17 years later, and he said that after that experience in Camp Leakey, and he talked about the orangutan jumping into his arms, he vowed that he would come back and do something for the orangutans at Camp Leakey. And what he did is he made an IMAX film, because he was working for IMAX, and it's called Born to be Wild, it's on the internet, and that is among the 10 highest grossing films that IMAX has ever made. This is IMAX itself. 
A lot of other companies use IMEX technology. So, you know, and those are the two things that are on the list. Those are the two things that I remember the most. So, orangutans do not have sonar, like dolphins, but they have a different kind of sonar. They have a different attitude towards the world. And this relates to the fact that ultimately, once they grow up, they become solitary. They live alone. And most of the time, they don't care. But sometimes you catch the attention, and you can make a very real connection with them. This is part of their fascination. Me and my first orangutan infant, my first child I called him, Sugito. Oh, and then from the very beginning, my former husband and I uh, worked with uh, the local people. And eventually my former husband, who was a very courageous, dedicated man, but you know, he wanted to do the Western things. He wanted to finish his, get his degree in physics, which he did. He wanted to continue, get his master's, and he ended up initially working for IBM, <laughs> you know. And um, he wanted to go back. And so I married, shortly afterwards, I married a local man. And uh, just him, Pabohab. And I've said it before, and I'll say it again. He was handsome then, and he's still handsome now. So the local Dayaks are, you know, golden-skinned and quite attractive. They're short, many of them, but it's really an issue. And the other thing is that I really wanted to be involved in Indonesia. I didn't want to be, you know, one of these foreigners that rushes into the native culture and you know, takes on the native dress. Not that. I wanted to be much deeper. So I um, asked for a local university in Jakarta to send me students from their biology department. And these are some of my first students. And let me go back. No, go forward. And these are some of my first students. These are students, I went to uh, Indonesia in 1971, and these are my students. I started having students in 1974. These are among my first students. And I'm very proud of them. Because all four of these students who worked with me in 1974, all eventually went abroad and got their PhDs. And none of them became a cabinet minister, but almost. So the one whose picture, you know, is a leading primatologist in Indonesia. He's a full professor at the University of Indonesia. He has lots of students. Uh, these two men uh, are retired now. <laughs> Tells you how old I am. Um, and uh, uh, they're leading primatologists and conservationists in Indonesia. And this one, just saw him did, maybe three days ago when I was still in Indonesia, um, is one of these leading rebellious type of conservationists, <laughs> you know, who speaks his mind. So we had an enormous influence uh, on the way that conservation and primatology developed in Indonesia. And that has to do with the fact that these students were the first primatologists in Indonesia. They're my students. Now, he's not my student. <laughs> this is Gundul, and uh, it's very interesting because he was in this cage the entire time flying from Java to Kalimantan. Look at this little rickety cage. It's basically a cage for chickens. And so, no problem in the plane, no problem in the transport truck. But then, the first morning, he woke up in Camp Leakey, he busted out in 30 seconds. So what that tells me is the entire time that he was in that cage, he could have busted out. But he didn't. You know, he was biding his time. He wanted to see what happened. So anyway, so I wanted to introduce you 
to some of the people that I have worked with and who carry on what I began even now, 50 years later in Indonesia, or 48 years later. So orangutans live in a variety of habitats. Peat swamp forest is much of where, um, no, I shouldn't say much, some of where I do my work because a third of our study area is seasonal peat swamp forest. And orangutans also live in the mountains in the central core of Borneo. And orangutans are mainly fruit eaters. 60% of their diet, if you examine it in terms of time of foraging, is fruit. And I mentioned the fact that there are orangutans in Borneo and orangutans in Sumatra. So when I first went there, there was one species. And these were subspecies. Now, there's three species. But originally, in 1981, the Bornean and the Sumatran subspecies were split into two species. And in 2017, we got a third species. And that was um, uh, Pongo Tapolenskis. And uh, uh, again, I'm going to be proud. <laughs> I'm going to say that I had a student who studied the species of orangutan, if indeed it is a actually a species, but it's acknowledged as such, uh, long before the split occurred. And, uh, and when the split was announced in a, in a press conference, actually, uh, some Indonesians said, well, you forgot Ibu Rene. You know, she's been studying these orangutans. She started studying them in the year 2000. Anyways. So let's talk about orangutan biology a little bit. And the fact that orangutans stay with their mothers for the first, at least in our area, for the first eight years of life. They sometimes suckle for the first eight years of life. And, I mean, they're totally dependent on their mothers. In Sumatra, remember I'm in Borneo, in Sumatra, Sumatra and orangutans sometimes stay with their mothers until they're 10, 11 years of, of life years old. And for the first five years, the orangutan infant is carried on the mother's body. Uh, when she moves from tree to tree, she carries her infant. And sometimes she makes a bridge. You know, she'll put her arms between two trees, and the infant will climb over her, over one arm, over the body, and then the other arm to the tree, next tree. So the relationship between mothers and juveniles, mothers and infants, is very, very, it's a derogatory juvenile, is very, very close. And once they reach adolescence, the life histories of males and females begin to diverge. And orangutan males and orangutan females look so different and in some ways acts so differently, that the local people, even, maybe not now, but when I first arrived in Borneo, they thought there were two types of orangutans. They were not the same animal, males and females. And it was interesting, because they thought, and they said, remember this 50 year, almost 50 years ago, that the males were ghosts. It was the, you know, the female was the orangutan, the male was the ghost orangutan. And why did they think that the male was the ghost orangutan? Well, I experienced it. I experienced it myself. I would be sitting on the ground in the forest, either resting or watching the orangutan up in the top of the canopy, and I'd look. And suddenly, maybe six or seven feet from me, there would be an adult male orangutan, a wild one, just sitting there. And I thought, like, how the heck did he get there? Well, they don't, you know, they don't have hooves, they don't have claws, they do have nails. So when they walk on the forest floor, they're very silent. And orangutans are very quiet animals, most of the time. So this is the adult male. So when an adolescent female <coughs> reaches the adolescent stage, uh, she stays with her mother off and on, 
Sometimes she's with her mother, sometimes she's traveling alone, <clears throat> sometimes she's traveling with her friends who are other females in the area, adolescent females usually, and sub-adult males. She usually doesn't have much contact with adult males, except she's trying to seduce them. Okay, so you have this nubile female, you know, kind of like this, maybe a little bit older, cute, you know, lush hair, you know, big liquid brown eyes, and she sees a cheek pattern, she goes up to him, you know, she grabs his cheek pads and she starts maneuvering them towards her. And what does the adult male do? He bites her. He tosses her out of the tree. Totally uninterested. Right? And then she goes to the next tree, and I've seen this several times, and she's squawking and squealing. You know, she doesn't like this. <laughs> she wants him, but he doesn't want her. Who does he want? Well, along comes a doddering old female with her adolescent son that hasn't left her, which is already unusual. And the adult male orangutans go crazy. And, you know, we know a little bit about sociobiology and about reproductive success and all those issues. Well, the adolescent female is probably still undergoing a period that has saved many a high school girl in the United States, and that is called adolescent sterility. Her period is just bumping into gear, so she's not ovulating regularly, you know. And it's true. I mean, uh, I followed adolescent females for several years when they consorted with sub-adult males or even adult males. And it wasn't until several years later that they produced an offspring. But along comes the doddering female, obviously a little senile with her adolescent son, and she's a known producer. The males go crazy about the known producer. So, And the adult male, or the male, has a different trajectory. What's happening here? We did, ah, here we go. Okay, this is a magnificent sub-adult male. And uh, his cheek pads are just beginning to uh, grow. He doesn't normally yet give the long call. And in the wild, he would be wandering. He would he'd leave, his, leave his mother's home range, and he'd wander. And he might not see his mother ever again. Adult male orangutan, dominant. Look at all the wounds on his cheek pads. He has fought many a combat. Because if you want to, if you're an adult male and you want to mate with an adult female, you have to combat other males. Now remember, you're totally solitary at this point. No allies. Okay, so this is how males communicate to females. Remember, they're solitary, they're in the forest alone, and what, this was a dominant male, uh, and what is he communicating with his long call? Well, he's saying, this is who I am, this is how powerful I am, which you can gauge from my long call. If you're a female who wants to mate, here I am, willing and ready, but if you're a male, don't come near me, because you will have to fight me, you'll have to do a combat. So. That is the lonely life of an adult male orangutan in the wild. And not surprisingly, it appears that you know, once an adult male loses his dominance, he almost literally shrinks, and his cheek pads disappear, and he no longer can stay in a, or he no longer chooses to stay in an area. He chooses not to fight anymore. He leaves, and he starts wandering. It's not having much luck here. Uh, anyways, I just put this photograph in here. Uh, this is taken from a zoo. This is an adult male orangutan and an infant. In the wild, they have very little to do with infants. 
You know, their paternal investment basically ends more or less when, you know, when the female gets pregnant. Then they move on or they move on to the next female. But in captivity, adult male orangutans make excellent fathers. That's the irony. The orangutans make nests. They're two users. They steal our boats, our dugout canoes. And the problem in Borneo, I'm going to start talking about conservation issues, is that the forests are disappearing. And so the estimated number of orangutans in the wild is actually, might seem like a lot, you know, how many do we have? We have 30,000 in our province. And that's more than all the other provinces uh, in Indonesian Borneo, or in Borneo period. And this is self-explanatory. At least 100,000 orangutans have been lost because of habitat destruction, direct killing. So I'd like to go through a little bit of the conservation threats. The main threat, of course, is deforestation. And commercial agriculture drives 71% of tropical deforestation in the world. And it's a similar figure in Indonesia. And who is responsible for much of this industrialization of agriculture that destroys the forest is palm oil. Palm oil is the cheapest vegetable oil in the world. And this is what is happening. Massive areas of forest are being decimated. And orangutans get in the way. They're the trees that are being destroyed, and people kill them. And then once palm oil is established, palm oil plantation is established, the orangutans who have no more forest come in and uh, strip the young palm oil plants of their inner shoots. And they're killed as pests. And palm oil is in everything. Now, illegal logging is not as bad as it once was because the forests are no longer there. And these are photographs that I took of the first one of illegal loggers in the middle of our national park. For years, we fought illegal loggers. And when I say fight, I mean physical, as well as psychological and legal. And this is an illegal logger. How can you tell he's illegal? Well, he's not wearing a shirt. And if you looked at his feet, he'd be wearing, you know, slippers. Or what do you call those? Plastic sandals. Flip-flops. Be wearing flip-flops. Be very different from a legal uh, logger who would be wearing a hard hat, you know, hard shoes, have a shirt on, all that. Legal mining. This is what illegal mining looks like. It's strip mining. And that's the only kind of mining that you, base, you have in Borneo. And virtually all of it is illegal. And this is what the pollution, when you go to Camp Leakey, to the right are the mines, because it's outside the national park, and to the right is Camp Leakey. This is the water, water, sorry. The water coming Doing, anyways, that was the water, the dark water, because the Sukhoni River is a dark water river, like the Rio Negro in Brazil, uh, which means that uh, the uh, plants are not totally dissolved. It's like tea. It kind of resembles tea. So what are we doing? We are the Orangutan Foundation International, an organization that I established uh, in 1986, and we do a lot of orangutan rescue, we rescue wild orangutans, and we translocate them into safe forests. We take care of infants, we do rehabilitation, we release, this is a released orangutan, and you know, the world is a funny place, so a, a photographer found this, this ex-captive orangutan, and assumed it was a wild one, and his picture won like, photograph of the year, for a wild orangutan. And I haven't had the heart <laughs> to say, wait a second, this is an orangutan that we rehabilitated, and this is the third rehabilitation site, release site that we released him on. So, anyways. 
he was rewilded to the point where a National Geographic photographer assumed he was wild. Uh, we also work in rainforest preservation, Tanjung Puting National Park. We also buy land. We are Indonesian, so we have the right to buy land. And that's what we do. And we have bought 6,000 hectares of land. And it's very difficult because you have to kind of circumlocute. But we've done it. And once you own it, you can protect it. You keep people out. And we also have a re uh, seeding and planting projects, rewilding a forest in the land that we own, and also in the national park. We also have, we have very strongly supported ecotourism. And ecotourism is a very powerful tool for conservation, as you may know from the mountain gorillas in Uganda and Rwanda, uh, but also in uh, Tanjung Puting, Camp Leakey is the number one tourist attraction in our province of central Indonesian Borneo. And I have to tell you something, that the, mo the nation from which the most foreigners come is Spain. I mean, number one visitors to Camp Leakey. I think number two is are Australians, of course. It's and why is it Spain? Well, some travel agents from Spain, you know, went to Camp Leakey, really liked it, and been promoting it. And that's one of the things that people can do. People say, well, what can you do to help the orangutan? One of the things you can do is go to these places, visit them. That's why I visited the mountain gorillas, I visited chimpanzees, simply because I wanted to help them. I bought souvenirs, even though I didn't need them, gave most of them away, but you help the local people and you help the local economy, especially where we are, because the local people own the boats, the tourist boats, the local people are the guides. So it's one of the national parks where foreigners and out-of-towners have not taken over the tourism industry. Okay, so we also do, uh, with the palm oil plantations, we do zero tolerance training sessions, which means that we have persuaded them to have no tolerance for orangutan killing, orangutan capture, orangutan torture, orangutan suffering, orangutan keeping, and that if somebody is caught, employee is caught, the company will immediately fire him or, you know, put him out on sabbatical, him, shusha him, and turn the case over to the police. That took us 10 months of nonstop intensive negotiation to get that. Uh, we also work with the communities. We publish uh, uh, a journal, I guess, it's, it's, it's more like a booklet, and we modeled it after National Geographic, and we have uh, very high production values. So people don't throw it away. They read it and they keep it. We also have volunteer construction teams come to Camp Leakey. And this was something that was done by a group of students from Egypt, from a you know, very elite kind of school. Most of the people were foreigners, but there were also Egyptians in it. We also do rehabilitation and release. Many of the infants come to us wounded. That's me with an orangutan infant named Lanang. We named him after the police sergeant who, uh, who uh, confiscated him. This is Lanang a few years later, and pretty soon Lanang will be released in our release camps, of which we have 14, actually now 15, and of those 15 release camps, only four are open to the public. So most of the releases and the rehabilitation is actually done out of the view of the public. And then we have Camp Leakey, education and research, and also now a tourist destination. <laughs> One of the reasons that people like Camp Leakey is they can, you know, you're not allowed to come close, but you can get relatively close to the orangutans. And this is Tom, who was the dominant male until two or three years ago. And we have a saying, whatever Tom wants, Tom gets. So he got that whole bag of orangutan. I mean, who's going to stop him, right? 
Not me. Education. Uh, we now have an education program in local schools. We started a year ago, and we have uh, given talks to 30,000 local children. And last month, we started the program in Jakarta, the national capital, because that's where the future politicians at a national level are going to come from. Our education center. And then, some of the most important things that, that we do is we protect the ancient forest, we patrol with the police, with the army, and then ourselves. Ourselves. When we're talking about the fact that this is, you know, deep swamp, we mean deep swamp. And then we have a tree planting program. This picture was taken a number of years ago. And this is the forest, that entire forest uh, was planted. And this is what a 10-year-old forest looks like. They grow pretty quickly, those trees in the tropical rainforest. We work to empower local farmers. How do you empower local farmers? When you help them increase their crops, their harvests. Okay, so we've come to an end, my talk, but I'd like to mention something again. I mentioned that orangutans are different, surprisingly different, because even though chimpanzees are our closest living relatives in the animal kingdom, who are orangutans? Orangutans are closer to our ancestors than we are. And the reasons are genetic, because genetically they have changed much less. They've changed much more slowly than the other great apes, including humans. So basically, when we look at an orangutan, we're not just looking at a cousin or a sibling. We are looking at someone, somebody, who could be an almost ancestor. No, they're not, but they could be an almost ancestor. So uh, that's something that we have to think about. And if they vanish from this earth, as they are on the bridge of doing, as populations in the wild, we're going to be left alone. You know? Our cousins will be gone. Chimpanzees are in danger of extinction in the wild, gorillas, bonobos, and of course, orangutans. So I'd like to close with, with something that I heard. I am an academic. What does that mean? Well, one of the things it means is I usually carry a pen and a notebook with me. And years and years and years ago, when Al Gore was the Vice President of the United States, you know, he was already talking, you know, wasn't talking climate change issues so much, but he was talking about the acidification of the world's oceans, he was talking about destruction of forests, um, he was talking about the ozone layer, he was talking a lot about conservation issues that over time have become more pressing and have coalesced into climate change. And he said something. So, you know, I'm listening to all this. And basically he was saying everything that I already knew. You know, my pen is poised, my notebook is in front of me. And, you know, coffee cups are clinging because, clink, clinking because he came from what he just flown in from Washington, D.C. And this was in Los Angeles in a major move, movie studio. And, you know, movie people go to bed very early because they have to get up really early, you know, to film. And so everybody was kind of tired, and there was conversation. He started his speech, and he looked kind of gray. You know, he looked as though he was still over the Midwestern United States because he'd just come in, he'd have flown in. He looked jet-lagged because uh, it was much later in Los Angeles, three hours later than in uh, Washington. And, you know, I kept waiting for him to say something that would strike me. And then finally he said it. It was very, very plain. And I think it's a message that he has continued to say throughout all the years since he is no longer vice president. And he said, he said, the conservation crisis is a spiritual one. And basically, you know, it doesn't matter what anybody says about it having to be collective and having to be, you know, political change, which is all true. But I think ultimately it depends on each and every one as individuals to do what we can to save orangutans, all animals, and ourselves. Because if orangutans go, the forests go, and we need those forests to produce oxygen, to produce whatever, 
as much as orangutans do. So thank you very much. My, sorry, I forgot to mention, this is not my book, but since this is a Congress on Scientific Communication, uh, somebody wrote a kid's book about my, uh, my work. And hopefully it'll be translated into Spanish and you can get it here. I had nothing to do with it, but it's still a book. And I think that uh, science, communication of science is very, very important. I don't know how it is in Spain, but in the United States, which is where our foundation is most based. I am not American. I've never been American. But our foundation is based in the United States. And, uh, uh, you know, scientific communication, you have to do it. And you have to do it in a way that engages the public. So one of the things I do is I have a Twitter account. And somebody forced me. I mean, somebody forced me to go on Twitter. They almost literally an arm lock on me, and they started tweeting. Oh, sorry. I said, somebody forced me to go on Twitter. I mean, they almost put an arm lock on me, and they started tweeting. So the first two tweets are not mine. But, you know, I looked at it, I said, this is, you know, I don't want somebody else tweeting in my name. So I started tweeting, and I got used to it. And I Instagram, too, but I only Instagram once a month. Yeah, same. So please follow me on Twitter. <laughs>